So this is Gubotic, which is a special directory. They brought me to a van, and they started telling me that I'm creating some chats, that I'm guilty of something, some deeds that I was hearing for the first time. So when I was brought to the local police office, and they immediately started to beat me in the office. It lasted about two hours. I kept fainting, and they kept giving me records for me to sign. They wanted me to sign a record that I have burned the residence of the Oman boss, or that I dismantled the water cannons, or that I organized marches, so they tried to impose some some stories on me. So when I faded for the second time, they called the ambulance and I ended up at the hospital, but they didn't stop them from staying next to my ward. They wanted to transport me back to the police. What happened? Unfortunately, it's still continuing to peaceful protesters and random citizens. So, this is the legal default happening every day. Everyone can be detained, beaten up, or brought to prison. I avoided the prison because of a miracle, and I managed to flee to Lithuania, but still investigators called me. Someone calls me, they threaten me, and say that they're waiting for me in Minsk. So what's happening now in Belarus is really scary. So if some people think that it's not very bad if people think that it's okay to have it in 21st century in the middle of Europe. I don't think so. And we hope international solidarity and international outcry because we can't cope with it in Belarus ourselves. I strongly hope that my case will be the first precedent in Belarus and internationally so that we can investigate into this case and all perpetrators are held accountable in line with the law. There are more than 600 cases of beating have been filed with the Investigative Committee of Minsk, but all these requests to launch investigations were rejected. They don't investigate into beatings or rapes and many other cases of people suffering much more than me. We also have about eight deaths in Minsk. I'll give the photo to a lawyer for legal assessment. Good afternoon. It's these actions are also prohibited by the international law. And the criminal code provides for responsibility for such actions in line with the international law. The Lithuanian criminal code contains an article 100.3 and it prohibits torture. So from what we heard from Maxim and other evidence, we see that he was tortured. Tortured by the authorities. We have lodged the application with the Prosecutor General's Office of the Republic of Lithuania requesting for in for investigation. It's a Lithuanian legislation contains a clause for criminal prosecution in absentia. 
when perpetrators are not in Lithuania. And we think that in this specific situation, uh, there are much evidence, not only statements, and it enables us to ask for investigation in line with the international law. So I think this would be a good example for other criminal cases and prosecutions for violations of human rights. Notably, along with the request, we also attached the medical records establishing bodily harm to the victim and the photo evidence after the torture. You might have seen the video of the detention. We also know that the suspect, the person who probably conducted this crime, didn't wear a mask and we assume in our opinion, this person is Nikolai Mikolaevich Karpenko, who is the head of Gubopik. He is a legal practitioner rather than a theorist. So not only because of political reasons, we see clear legal possibilities and legal avenues of prosecuting such people in Lithuania. I'm giving the floor to Alexander. My name is Alexander Dabravolsky. I'm the advisor of Svetlana Tsikhanovska and I work in her team and we coordinate with a group of lawyers in various countries investigating into and preparing such applications in other countries. The universal criminal jurisdiction enables investigations in many countries and we think that our People's Tribunal plan aiming at stopping the repressions via many measures should stop the repressions. And we are creating a single book of crimes with the possibility to report a crime, to verify the proof, and to draft materials for launching investigation in various countries. Also in Vilnius, we are going to establish a coordination center on international jurisdiction matters, international universal jurisdiction hub to stop the repressions in Belarus. Mikolai Karpanko has been mentioned. He's an ODS person. He is the head of the main directorate for combating organized crime and corruption, now reappointed as the deputy minister of interior. And this odious person is running around the city of Minsk with a baton, as well as in other cities, beating people, beating shop windows. So there is evidence of him doing this. And we really want these people to reach the finish line as soon as possible. We want this impunity to stop, and they should not be surprised to end up on the lists of Interpol. Uh, thank you. We will now turn to uh, Belarus, where we have some of our colleagues who will give their comments, and afterwards it will be uh, time for questions. Good morning. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. And this topic is really sad. 
I don't repeat, I will not repeat about the importance of these events for the Belarusian people in our country to take the democratic path of development. The human rights violations are massive in Belarus. Torch, people are tortured, people are bullied. We used to read about such things in our school books about the great patriotic war, and I could never imagine something like this happening in today's Belarus. Scary as it is, it's happening with plenty of evidence proving it, including videos and testimonials of the victims. And it calls for justice and holding perpetrators accountable. Unfortunately, as Maxim has said, not a single case has been launched on any of these cases. And the statement of Alexander Lukashenko leaves no hope. He said that, well, as he was speaking to prosecutors of Belarus, he said that sometimes we should leave the law aside. So probably in his opinion, this time is the, during this time, the priority for him is to preserve his power rather than sticking to the law and any moral principles. With our tools in Belarus, so far we can only document these crimes. This is what human rights defenders and journalists are doing. But we also need international support and solidarity. And we hope that this initiative launched in Lithuania will help us to stop these crimes, to stop the violence in Belarus, and to restore the justice. And in as much as possible, we will contribute to it. So I'm open to your questions now. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so we, we, we return now to Vilnius to the press conference and we will, we are already having some questions, so we'll give some questions and then we'll ask you to answer. We have received several questions from Reuters. Andre Cetus is asking, in which other countries are you going to lodge similar lawsuits? We are preparing such complaints in Poland. We are also working on lodging complaints in Germany, Belgium and Netherlands. How many such lawsuits do you think are possible? And uh, how many more countries can be included? And what's the role of Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya in this process? There will be many complaints, since hundreds of uh, victims of torture ended up outside Belarus. But there will not be many countries, since the main condition is that the victim has to be in the country that provides protection. And this is a mandatory condition as a rule. So usually these will be the countries where Belarusians, Belarusian victims of oppressions are or will end up in. Sikhanovska is not doing it on a daily basis, however, we as her team are in consultations with international group of lawyers working on theoretical and practical aspects of universal criminal jurisdiction for defending the Belarusian citizens and holding the perpetrators accountable. One more question from Reuters. What is the desirable outcome that you want to achieve with these complaints? The final outcome. 
The final outcome that we want is to convict the perpetrators in Belarus. The interim result is to include the convicts, convicted perpetrators, to add them to the Interpol lists, on the international wanted list. So this will be probably a question to the lawyer from BNS. We want to clarify what the Prosecutor General's Office of Lithuania is supposed to do according to the application. As I understand, this is the first precedent. So what should the Prosecutor's Office do with it? So on this application, we want the Prosecutor General's office to launch a pre-trial investigation. I could agree with you that this is happening for a first time. However, actually, Lithuanian authorities have experience of doing such things. Since we have our very well-known case of January the 13th, in absentia, conducted in the absence of the accused perpetrators, and also the case of Barnaskas and Antonov, who are also not in Lithuania. And we also had the case on the death of Patsunas, who died in Belarus. So experience of investigating into crimes beyond Lithuanian territory exists. And this is a normal pre-trial investigation. The only peculiarity being that potential perpetrator is not in Lithuania. But as I said, the Lithuanian legislation contains a clause on running the investigation and trial in absentia, which means that the perpetrators are not in Lithuania. Uh, we also have a question in English, uh, Mr. Uh, Danielius. If you could, uh, Vaidas Aljunas from Delphi asks, how do you practically picture any consequences of any legal victories in Lithuania or other countries? if Belarus does not extradite, extradite regime officials. If you could please answer also in Russian for our uh, viewers. As I said, a victory in such an investigation is the conviction as such. And coming back to my previous answer, we don't ask ourselves what is the desirable outcome of the trial against Antonovas and Baranauskas, though they are not in Lithuania either. When answering this question on extradition, Extradition is not necessary for the trial if there are other proofs enabling to deliver a sentence in such a trial, since as I have mentioned, trial in absentia is possible according to Lithuanian legislation in the absence of the accused perpetrator, which means that the extradition as such is not a necessary precondition for the process as such. Uh, thank you very much. We, we do not have any more questions. I do apologize for technical difficulties that we had. If you wish to get the uh, video uh, from this press conference, please also send us an email at info at uh, BNSLT. So thank you very much. Spasiba.